the problem would be weird. Good morning, everyone, and good morning, Canada, and good morning to those who are joining from Mongolia, and good morning from those who are joining from Europe. And if there's anyone else who's joining from anywhere else, good day, good morning. Oh, good day. Um, so this is, um, thank you all very much for joining our um, series on Mongolia election campaign update. And this is our last update before the election on June 24th. Um, yeah, and uh, I'll be your moderator and my name is Bulgan. Uh, so our speakers today, oh, let me have to my slides. Uh, we have Julian, I think many of you know Julian. Uh, he is with the School of Public Policy and Global Affairs at the University of British Columbia. And he also uh, hosts, uh, leads the Mongolia Focus blog post. And we have Dr. Marisa Smith. Uh, Marisa has PhD from Princeton University. And she is a member of the board of directors at the American Center for Mongolian Studies. And she has been conducting research in Mongolia since 2007. Uh, we also are joined by Robert Reitz. He's a PhD candidate in sociology, Eder University, and director of the uh, American. Uh, where is the name? Sorry, just a second. Um, Lead to Mongolia American University, and many additional research has been done by Bim uh, Dr. Bim Jal, Darla Boing, and Dr. Minde Jarab Sahan. And I also reference research uh, carried out by. Camilla Barry, she is joined join our uh, call this morning. Yep. And before we start, I want to give you a small housekeeping message. And as you may know, that uh, this session is being recorded for about the next 40 minutes or so. And the video will be posted on our blog post and social media channels. And once the presentation is done, we'll be stopping the recording and you can join us for the Q&A session. Uh, for the Q&A session, you can send us a text or you can use the raise hand function. Yep. Thank you very much, Julian, and over to you. All right. Thanks, Burgan, for the introduction. Good morning, everyone. Uh, at least Burgan and I are coming to you from the ancestral, unceded, and historical treaty of the Musqueam people uh, here on the west coast of uh, what we call Canada now. Um, we, um, it's, a, it's a trying time for the world. It's good to remember community and uh, we, we just acknowledge that those are the communities uh, that have been on these lands uh, that we sit on uh, for a long, long, long time. Um, and it's very good to remember that. All right, let's see, what are we gonna do today? Uh, we're gonna look uh, at a bit of a, we'll just give you a bit of an update, but then specifically look at platforms focused on educational policy. Um, Marissa is gonna talk a bit about anti-corruption Bulgan is going to um, highlight some features of uh, gender dynamics um, in the campaign. And Robert is going to talk a little bit on, uh, about the role of Facebook. Uh, and then we'll finish up with a bit of an outlook. Um, just a quick update. What's happened since last week, um, since we last spoke, so to say. Um, I guess the, one of the bigger news in the campaign is that the DP has formally come out and said, uh, if elected, um, there will nominate Ahmad Jagger for uh, Prime Minister. Ahmad Jagger, of course, former Prime Minister in the late 90s, uh, foreign minister in the late 90s as well, longtime member of parliament, though not for the last four years. Um, uh, you know, uh, I, I wrote a post about this, but a bit of an attempt to, to rally around um, someone who is perhaps a little bit outside of, or perceived to be outside of the, the power circle of the DP and some of the factional fighting. And so uh, probably an attempt to appeal to voters elsewhere, not just to get him elected. He's running in Tsukhpata, which of course is the most competitive of all the ridings. Uh, so he probably needed a boost as well, but it's uh, probably an, an attempt by the DP for a bit broader appeal. Um, a bit worrisome is all the legal shenanigans, shall we call them, going on. Um, court appointments, uh, people being dragged into court, um, you know, bail hearings, all the like. Uh, now, uh, former Prime Minister Bayas' uh, trial uh, has started. Um, it's a little bit difficult to make what, a, to, what to make of this. Um, some in the DP and Batu has been particularly vocal. This is former uh, Golden Sparrow, of course, and former mayor of uh, Ulaanbaatar, Batu, hero of Mongolia, uh, has been particularly active in this and has um, mused publicly about boycotting um, or calling for boycotts for the election in the ridings affected. Um, we'll see what happens uh, on Wednesday. But let's continue what we did in the last two sessions, which, look, look, which is to look at some specific policy areas and to see 
what the parties are proposing. And education is, a, is an important one in that regard. Um, because if you speak to, so when I speak to people like Bulgan, Mongolians that are studying here in Canada, um, one of the reasons they're concerned about often um, returning to Mongolia at some point is education for the kids. And that's the same thing you hear within Mongolia. People who have kids uh, worry about uh, overcrowded schools. This is obviously particularly the case in, in Ulaanbaatar. So, or the flip side uh, of overcrowded, of course, is under-resourced. There's a lot of concern and there has been for, I'd say about a decade or so about access to higher education. So the sense that um, even the state universities that should be relatively open um, to most Mongolians are difficult to um, access uh, in terms of cost, but also in terms of getting in. There's ongoing concerns, I think, around um, curriculum uh, and school management issues. Uh, school management being sort of a euphemism for every time there's an election, everyone gets cycled out. Um, and then there's also concerns about this, this sort of twin um, substance matter, which is skills. That is, is there, are there enough vocational skills being offered in schools to prepare um, young Mongolians for careers, but also values, uh, re repeating concern around uh, traditional values, hit Mongolian history and the like. Um, it's a topic that's particularly important to younger voters, as you might expect, uh, people who are sort of in their stage of education and read a, um, read a post um, early on in the campaign that looked particularly at the interests of, uh, of younger voters and education ranks quite highly for them. So let's see what the parties uh, say specifically about educational policy. Uh, and let's focus on the school level first, so the, so the K through 12 roughly. Um, and I've, I've uh, limited this um, just to the, the Mongolian People's Party, the Democratic Party, and then to the right person electorate um, coalition, partly because out of interest. Um, and this relies really on, on a bit of work that uh, Biamjov and Mende uh, did. Um, so the MPP says, oh, we're gonna build all these kindergartens and schools. Um, and that's primarily aimed at um, relieving some of the infrastructure issues. And again, this is mostly aimed at Ulaanbaatar. Um, but it, it's a program that seems extremely ambitious, given that the growth in number of schools has certainly not been at this pace recently. And so uh, while it sounds, I mean, obviously, if this many schools were built, uh, that would relieve some of the pressure. Um, but the likelihood of that happening seems relatively low. Um, but nevertheless, it's set out as a goal. Uh, you might recall that roughly, oh, I think it was about 10 years ago or so, um, the MPP introduced uh, Cambridge curriculum to schools. And so there's talk of expanding that um, and having it reach out to different grades and, and, and sort of deepen it into education. Uh, and there's also some reference to more Mongolian history, um, more national values, uh, more traditional sorts, uh, something that, that shows up in, uh, in a whole lot of these uh, campaign materials, uh, particularly on education. The DP is a little bit less specific about how it's gonna address uh, some of the structural or infrastructure issues, uh, but it is targeting uh, class sizes of under 30 students. Um, again, this is primarily an issue for urban areas uh, where this, the class sizes are often significantly larger than that, particularly at the secondary level. And as you know, uh, many schools have a second or a third shift of uh, people coming through, kids coming through. Uh, and so their target is not a specific number of schools, but rather to provide enough to, to drop the class size to under 30, uh, in many ways equally ambitious to what the MPP has laid out here. And, and equally, you know, m one might have some doubts about the realism of that goal. Uh, the DP is putting, pushing a bit more for compulsory English. And again, this is something that um, President Enchbaya, oh, I don't know if anyone remembers the year, but somewhere in the mid 2000s had already announced that uh, English was gonna be a sort of a second language. And so this is an ongoing skill, a little bit of reference to, to computer skills, digital literacy and the like in the DP platform. Um, then the Right Person Electorate Coalition um, has, has some specific issues that they're trying to introduce uh, into the curriculum. One of the more interesting ones and novel ones, I think, is this idea of having kids, this is aiming particularly at urban kids, sent out to herder households. Um, so don't, don't push traditional values into the curriculum necessarily, uh, but why not instead uh, have um, kids do a bit of a practicum in a herder household to understand what the herd economy and if you will sort of the roots of, of Mongolian tradition and culture are like. Then on the vocational and higher education side um, also some some general emphasis 
on um, vocational education and support for it, but some different approaches. But first, uh, for at the university level, uh, the MPP is talking about access to more loans and um, wants to target scholarships, particularly at the best students. Um, whereas the DP uh, emph emphasizes study abroad scholarships a little bit more uh, and is looking to introduce some new curriculum um, and some new job categories into vocational education um, as a measure to provide Mongolian students with, uh, with more skills there. Um, so Hun is again a little bit different here. Um, they call for more transparency in the scholarship selection rather than necessarily more money, uh, but just a better sense of how these scholarships are, are distributed. Um, they're pointing to three-year university degrees as, a, as one way to address perhaps some of the access issues, um, to sort of go from a typical four-year to a three-year, at least as an option. Uh, and they're looking to incentivize um, private investment in vocational education more than necessarily creating uh, state structures uh, that would address this. All right, I'll pass it on to Marissa then to talk a little bit about what anti-corruption measures the parties are proposing. Unmute myself. Yeah, thank you, Julian. Um, yeah, so I was sort of hoping to see a bit more on social media than I've been seeing read this issue. Um, just kind of to touch on the people being arrested, um, I would say that those, looking at those names, it's significant to me who's been arrested, right? Um, we have Bartsakt, who was, um, hopefully I'm not messing this up. He was the one of the people in the uh, offshore offshore scandal. We have Gonbold, who was the person put in charge of the nationalized or uh, whatever happened with the 49% of Erdonet. He was involved in that. Um, so anyway, the names, the names, um, it looks to me like there's a statement trying to like the MPP or someone is trying to make a statement in like, okay, we're going to be hard on these people who were involved in a particular type of corruption. They're trying to define corruption, right? So I would say that. Um, I've seen a couple of uh, sort of uh, videos and memes sort of floating around um, candidates, Facebook pages and stuff, but that was more like the third parties. I haven't really seen it with DP and MPP as much, um, but there's in particular, there's, there's like a very well produced video about Manon, I think was initially put out by um, actually uh, one of the, one of the Sheen people and then there was there's also this interesting video where it's like a it's a video of everyone in parliament standing up and then they pop like a little jdu a little uh sme who all the people who have the sme um uh companies in front of them and it's actually looks like a little coronavirus it's like a coronavirus shaped thing and it says jede u on it um so that was another thing i saw floating around but it was more being shared by like um also, the the Todd Bidney um, um, coalition also were sharing that. So anyway, so that's a little bit about what's going on in terms of that. But I haven't really seen just kind of casually <laughs> looking on Facebook and Twitter. I haven't seen like kind of big discussions of corruption happening. Um, okay, so what's actually in these uh, platforms? I went and took a look again at DP, MPP, and Zufun in particular. Um, so it's interesting. You have um, in the MPP, you have this kind of stuff appearing a bit more in the section about government and government structure, whereas with the DP, it's appearing a bit more in like economics. And they had this heading that was like immunized business. So that, that was where they had the stuff about anti-corruption. Um, and of course, the word they're generally using is, is avoga, which is interesting word can sort of translate to like graft, money being taken from somewhere and going somewhere it shouldn't. So that's what they're trying to fight. Um, with the MPP, notably, so some of these very specific like government structure things were like limit the authority of Ikharal members over budget and finances. Um, there was some stuff about number of people who could be both parliament members and in the cabinet. Um, and then there was an interesting point about like limiting people who are on like national security, Zuvlo, uh, and who can actually get, I guess, business contracts rec related to national security. Um, things like that. There was also um, in all three of these parties' platforms a lot of stuff about the judiciary. And frankly, I need a little bit more time to, to sort through that. Um, uh, across the board, it was like there needs to be independence with the judiciary. But 
what exactly that means, I think is a, is a complicated thing and I need a little bit more time to look at that. Um, there was also a lot of concern about professionalism and, and who is, um, I guess, who, who the judges are and what their actual credentials are. So that was a concern too. Um, also the DP did, when they did talk about sort of law and these sorts of corruption things working properly, they had a heading that was like, this, the law should protect citizens was, was actually how they kind of framed it. That was interesting. Um, uh, Zhu Hun talked a lot about institutions and building institutions, but it wasn't that specific, but just notably they used this word institutes a lot. Um, the, they also had a, some stuff about, for professionalization, they wanted to like basically give the civil servants um, like um, evaluations every five years. So again, there's this like, who are these people running the government and we're gonna ensure that they're, you know, the right people. Um, okay, next slide. Okay, so um, yeah, in terms of kind of what things were being circulated on social media um, for these three sort of ma more main parties, I, I, would, I saw things like, um, this is basically a set of graphs that um, are basically saying like, hey, our, our GDP, uh, these two big parties have been running the country for 30 years and, oh, our GDP is along with um, these um, countries like Burundi and Namibia. Um, there's also a little graph, the one on the lower right is about the exchange rate and it's, you know, showing the Tobruk um, to dollar shooting up. So, so that, that is a, there's also like a little interview with, um, I think his name is Nadla, like circulating where he's kind of, he's standing in front of the parliament building and sort of saying similar things like, I'm gonna, we're gonna do better basically. Um, so, you know, that's, that's like fairly, that's fairly not direct criticism. Although you also see here, they are talking about Manon. Um, okay. So about these, oh, can I go back? Thank you. Um, so developing the economy, the DP again is fate is putting a lot of, they did mention small medium, which again, looking back at that scandal, that's on people's minds. Um, small medium businesses, uh, they're, they did say something about like reforming the fund, but it was vague. Um, but yeah, they want to, they want to have startups um, and it's supposed to be very digital, but then also there was some language about connecting traditional businesses more to the internet, but it was kind of hard to tell what they meant with that. Um, and then uh, Zufkun was, was saying a lot of stuff about separating parties from business networks, but I didn't get a sense of the mechanisms. It could have been like my Mongolian and the amount of time I had to devote to reading it, but it seemed not, that was a very big theme. I'm not sure how specific they were, um, one thing that was interesting is they wanted to put the uh, uh, government owned uh, companies on the stock exchange and also make them more transparent. Um, so this is also stuff that kind of is on that economy and corruption area. Okay, I have one more slide. Um, yeah, so digitalization featured as something that these parties were saying would address corruption um, and the the reasons they were saying that would do that would be um, sort of making it easy for people to to pay their fees and pay their taxes and everything, um, but also like educating people and getting them information. Um, and then um, I'm also I'm assuming or there was a, like surveillance that that it would be more obvious somehow to that these things were being done. Um, but yeah, I think there's a lot of assumptions, you know, kind of baked into these, these proposals. And this is obviously not specific to Mongolia at all, right? Um, so there was also, um, in the DP and MPP, they were, they thought that, you know, oh, we should make the, we can make government also more participatory in some, some way for citizens if we make these things go online somehow. And the DP, the DP was specifically actually talking about the, the Haral and how citizens could, um, but it was a bit unclear to me if they were just sort of talking about like people being able to read um, what was under debate, like what sort of participation would be involved. Um, but I, I would like to take a look at again at that more closely. Um, okay, so again, that's what I found in the platforms. Um, I, I haven't seen a lot of any of this really being reflected in sort of discussions or conversations on social media though, so I'm not sure what will, what will happen with it, but yeah. Okay, um, over to Bulgan. Thank you, Marisa. Uh, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about the women representation in 
um, in, in the candidate as well as in the parliament. So this, um, this slide shows on, on the left-hand side, um, I took a photo from Doug Byer, one of his many, uh, many drawings, comics, uh, on women representation in the decision-making level. So the man is saying, Mongolian government's threshold is high, come on in if you can. And the woman carries the luggage that says family, work, kids, and stuff like that. So um, it's very relevant to the graph next, next to it. So far, we have, uh, in 2020, we have, uh, from 2016 to 2020, we have 13 women in the parliament that's holding seats. And in the democratic history of Mongolia, that's since 1992 to today, we, there was um, seven elections and a total of 50 seats were um, occupied by women. And those 50 seats, of course, there's a repeated number. In those 28 years, uh, I did lots of <laughs> checking and investigating the names. We have 36 women in total. And, um, and out of those 36 women, six are experienced, meaning that they were been elected more than, more than two times. And the list is, of course, led by um, Sanjay Surangalung, and she's been elected five times. And we have Gandhi and Olung Horst, both of them running for the uh, seats this uh, election. And uh, those two women have been parliament member for four times before. Yeah. And uh, I can also speak to, uh, to the drop in 2008. We had three women. But in 2012, the number increased drastically to, to 11. The reason being that is that we have a we had a quota uh, for that year, uh, and the women candidates had to be 20 percent. That's why the increase of number. Also, another factor could be that, or not could be. I think another factor is that that election we used the mixed system, so that's both uh, block voting system as well as the proportional representation system. Yeah, okay, to my next slide. So barriers to women participation in politics. It is very interesting. So a uh, great article written by Camille Barras on our blog post, uh, Mongolia Focus. And then, so the fact is that despite women vote at a considerably higher rate than men in Mongolia, and despite the fact that women participate in more in many different forms of political activities than men, and if you didn't know, despite the fact that women, uh, more women graduating from university and more girls are finishing high schools, that we have that small number of women who are sitting in a parliament. Um, so definitely these are due to the fact that we have a strong gender stereotype, uh, strong use of gender stereotype in Mongolia. Um, and in the same article that Camilla Barras uh, wrote, so, she, there's an Asian barometer survey. Um, and then in that, from the respondents out of, uh, all respondents out of 36% uh, of men agree or strongly agree that women should not be involved in the politics as much as men. And one third of the women think the same. So it's, it's, it's significant and it's, a, it's this value, uh, Camille says it's the highest among the Asian region. Um, and then I also included a small um, graph down there to see that um, uh, the women candidates and male candidates and then percentage of the women female candidates there as well. I, I, I wanted to show that because as I mentioned earlier, the election system seemed to be playing a significant role, uh, a significant role as well, because as you can see in that graph in 2012, we had 172 uh, female candidates, and that was 32%. Um, I'm glad that the number of female member of parliaments increased from three to 11, and it, in 2016, it did not reduce, it increased to 13. So I'm hopeful this year as well. And this year from the candidate, it's reduced from last year, it's 24.9% on the 151 women out of uh, 606 uh, candidates. Another thing is, of course, campaign financing, right? Um, I think it's the it's same everywhere that um, the access to finance and pooling of uh, funding is, is a challenge. 
Um, and one of the things I would be very much interested to see um, after the election, I think today people are start reporting on their finance, uh, the money that uh, they were able to collect and then the spending. Uh, and I, I did see one of the women, so it would be interesting to comparative uh, the, uh, analysis of how women, how much money they collected compared to men. Yeah. I included three photos here. And um, uh, so the first photo left in the corner, uh, she's wearing Korea. She's running from DP from in Silin province. And her campaign from starting, uh, it was like a lot of um, physical fitness, a lot of exercise. And uh, she's assembling or deassembling guns and shooting exercises. Uh, in here, it says she's a, the campaign word says, um, what is it? Like um, unstoppable uh, labor or something like that. And another photo on the top, uh, on, the, on the corner, right corner is Sogdal Kuma. And she's running in uh, Ulaanbaatar, uh, Bangal district. And her slogan says, female, but, the more, but stronger. So it's also very interesting how they seem to be portraying uh, image, seem to be trying to portray an image that's, um, uh, that's like that's strong or female, but you know, it's, uh, and then top photo is Uyang, Uyanga, Togdulma and Uyanga, both of them, uh, this is their, uh, this will be their second, they're experienced parliamentarian. Uyanga also uh, used this photo as her, um, uh, used it on her material, the brochures that she's distributing. Yeah, okay, the next slide. So, but we also have some uh, candidates uh, or one party in specific, which Marissa reported uh, a lot on, uh, is the Demos Party, Song of Nenam. Um, and uh, it's really uh, cool that, uh, to cool to see the women running as women. And I have a one uh, independent candidate, Nara. She's really like taking the pink color and talking a lot about the women issues and then all of those uh, in, in very specific. And of course, you know, social media, it's really hard to see because on Nara, she's been attacked by all sorts of like nasty messages, nasty uh, comments and all of it, right? And people are really using demeaning and bigotry language and it's hard to see. But I think that's kind of the general nuance of how the gender stereotype has, has a strong root in Mongolia. So Nam, the focus is, um, uh, the slogan is uh, age, age means mom. And it's an abbreviation, standing an abbreviation for women issues and gender issues and mother and children issues. Uh, on the other hand, Nara, uh, she's talking, or she's focusing more on family, family responsibility, and family education, domestic violence, and kids-related issues. Um, it's um, I, I did look at Nara's report on the finance. Uh, she was able to collect uh, in both in kind and cash contribution of about uh, 9,000 Canadian dollars, 18 million Mongolian tubrooks. And she spent about uh, 14 million, so that's about 7,000 uh, $7, uh, dollars in kind and of cash, of course. And then she returned, um, so she returned the remaining. Yeah, um, so that almost concludes my presentation on the gender and women issues. Let me just see my notes I had. Uh, of course, oh yeah, I'll talk to, uh, so the hope for this election, I hope, uh, I am, I'm hopeful that this election we would not, um, that the number of women would not be reduced. So I, I am a bit uh, concerned. Uh, Bim Chao uh, wrote an article on the Mongolia blog post comparing 2008 and 2020 election. And this is, this is uh, scary, right? We're using the blog voting system. It's not really favorable to women. Um, and uh, we have so many candidates running, so I don't know. But I'm hoping that uh, this year we will have more uh, younger voters uh, and they will definitely, I hope they will be having a different impact on the election um, yeah, compared to the previous years. I, I hope that I'm um, thinking that more younger voters will vote is that because um, there's been a lot of campaigns encouraging uh, young, targeting young voters to vote. 
and there's some of them it's been really cool some of the ones that's been running by the uh, the young groups such as the Eric foundation they've been doing an amazing job yeah yeah i'll hand it over to robert all right so um, I'm talking about Facebook and Facebook is, you know, as you uh, many of you probably know is pretty much popular in Mongolia um, Whereas on Twitter you'll find maybe the politically literate people or people who are more interested in current events Facebook is really where the mass gathers um, There's this number here. That's 1.32 million active Facebook accounts in Mongolia This number was derived by um, actually the CRC the Communications Regulatory Commission and Facebook They put this number out last year the total number is actually 2.2 million, but they're, they're, the CRC estimates that it's 40% of them are fake. I think by fake, I think they mean like inactive or, or sort of not sort of current accounts. So we can come to this 1.32 million number. Um, obviously, Facebook is an uh, obvious route for, for advertising um, for uh, political campaigns. And since, um, well, since 2018, uh, Facebook has been working closely with uh, the General Election Commission and the CRC. However, um, and I think this is important to note, that the focus of their co cooperation has always been stated to be fake news and misinformation. Um, and the reason why this initiative kind of started from Facebook is, of course, because of the 2016 elections in the U.S. and Europe, where you had foreign interference, for example, documented pretty widely. Um, and many elections, and you also had this issue of uh, dark ads. Now, dark ads, if you're familiar with how Facebook ads work, is where you can create an advertisement that's targeted towards um, specific demographics that are not sort of public or visible to other people. Only those specific people will be targeted. Um, campaigns use this highly effectively. Um, like, to, to be honest, they, one of the original uh, originators of the strategy was Barack Obama in the United States. Very highly effective strategy um, doing this. Um, and you can specifically micro-target messages to certain demographics within, you know, a five-year age range or, or micro-targeting toward lo location and things like that. So Facebook, in response to all of this, these dark ads and also the foreign interference in the 2016 elections around the world, created this uh, thing called the Facebook Ad Library. Um, in 2018. Now this ad library, the goal is not to, to catalog all ads. The goal is, which it, it does, but the goal is to categorize or catalog political advertisements. Um, and this is uh, something that's really, really important to remember. Um, George Chen, who's the head of public policy for Hong Kong, Taiwan, and Mongolia, um, has been really visible in this area in Mongolia and has been here multiple times. Um, and you can see here the picture uh, from a 2019 uh, conference where he's actually talking about and kind of introducing Facebook and the tools and committing Facebook uh, to, to helping uh, with Mongo in Mongolia to fight fake news and misinformation. Okay, go, you can go to the next slide. So, okay, so why is this, uh, you know, ad library? What is it all there for? What, what's it supposed to be there for? Well, it basically allows for transparency and political advertising. And the reason why you want this transparency is to avoid, um, uh, for example, in Mongolia, if you want to be uh, to advertise as a can candidate, um, the General Election Commission will actually certify your page and things like that. Um, this is really important so that the GEC can actually monitor the ads to make sure they're, uh, in, you know, following the applicable laws uh, and that they're not uh, cheating. Um, this transparency is really important because if you don't have it well, then uh, you don't really know uh, if people are doing the right thing or not. Um, but there's a really big trick here, which is that if you want to have these ads searchable uh, in the ads library, they have to be marked political. By default, ads are not marked political because you know obviously you can have ads for many different types of things on Facebook. Um, right now, Facebook is not enforcing the marking of these ads in Mongolia. And I, I was very shocked to find this out because Facebook was touting their Facebook ad library that was rolled out globally. Um, and I was really shocked um, uh, to find out that in Mongolia, very, very, very few ads are actually being marked uh, political. Um, and just a, a side note here is, is that 
while the Facebook ad library is searchable from their web portal, the real power here is the API, which is the application programming interface, which would allow more technical users um, and researchers to actually gather the data on these ads and perform analysis on it. For example, the GEC could even um, search for keywords and to see if um, other uh, pages who are not supposed to be running campaign, um, political ads are running political ads. Um, and without this marking and enforcement of this marking, the API is essentially useless in Mongolia. I did find six candidates that were marking their ads correctly, um, and only six candidates, in fact. Uh, so there's Olsi Saikin from our coalition from Dorno, uh, running in Dornodameg, Ankh Bayer is who's an independent from uh, in Chingolte, Gantulug from the right person electorate in Bayernzerk, Davasaran an independent for Sukhvater, uh, Hadav Munch from an independent for Saling, and Onur Boller uh, who's from an MPP, which is actually the only, uh, you know, sort of large established party uh, uh, besides the right uh, Gantulga from Zulfun uh, for uh, Saling. Every other candidate uh, out of you know, the other 600 or so are not running their ads being marked as political. This is a big, a big problem, big, big pro problem. I posed the question too on Twitter, you know, threw it out there, um, and I said I was really shocked by this. Uh, Facebook has said that they've been working closely with the GEC and the CRC. Um, and uh, Anand uh, Togo, who's an independent journalist actually, um, posted this question. He said, well, you know, when will third party entities and journalists be able to monitor campaigns using the Facebook API in Mongolia? And George Chen basically kind of rolled it off and said, hey, this is not a big deal. Basically, we have these enforcement things, but they're not being rolled out yet in Mongolia. And he said, you know, much to do about nothing. You know, there's a currently a parliamentary election. They've committed to starting a war room in Mongolia that would actually fight misinformation. Um, but they are not enforcing their own policies on Facebook. Um, however, they are enforcing advertising for credit and housing opportunities. So if you try and run an ad for like a bank uh, for a credit card, those get flagged um, and you have to verify that you follow the ethical advertising policies on Facebook. But political ads have no such enforcement currently, which seems really strange because credit in Mongolia is basically non-existent. So I was really surprised by that and, and somewhat disappointed in Facebook um, for this reason. Okay, next slide. So why is ad transparency important? Well, um, without this ad transparency, um, it, it is actually very possible for pages that are not being monitored by the GEC or CRC to run political ads without any sort of oversight. This could be um, you know, fake pages or you know, just you know, flash pages that show up they spit out a lot of ads and then they just disappear. Um, you know, you saw this kind of thing in the 2016 election in the United States and, and around the world. Um, also tagging, if you actually enforce the tagging rules, will allow you to actually search for certain keywords and topics, which would be very, very valuable if you're trying to identify certain you know, demographics or issues that other people may be trying to target. Now on the right here, you can see the picture. This is an example, if an ad is marked as political, you can see the kind of information you can actually get. Um, so you can see um, obviously the page and the ad that actually um, that was put out there. You can see the amount of money they're spending, the duration of the campaign, how many people it roughly reached. Um, and you can also see the demographics and the location targeting. And this is really important. And I was just poking around and I could see actually um, uh, Ulti Saiken, she's really definitely targeting younger voters, uh, whereas others in the city are targeting older voters. I thought that was interesting, but there's only, this is a very, very small sample size, obviously. Um, uh, I should say, and this is a really big, you know, grain of salt here, and, you know, George Chen even said, no need to speculate. It is very possible that the GEC and CRC are actually monitoring these things, but there is no transparency whatsoever happening currently. Uh, we don't really know um, what the GEC or CRC are monitoring or are not monitoring. Um, last week, there were a few Facebook pages taken down. Um, no one really knows why. The pages were put back up. The candidates said something, but then most of them have deleted their posts since then. So we don't really know why or what happened. Um, and this is uh, quite uh, troubling. 
you know, I believe that enforcement will probably happen before the next election next year for the presidential election. But right now it's, it's quite, um, quite a big problem and it, and it really limits our ability to monitor. So that's it for, for Facebook, um, but, uh, but hopefully it will get better going forward. Okay, um, thanks Marissa Bulgan and Robert. Um, just to provide a little bit of an outlook, right? Wednesday is election day. Uh, and uh, that means the campaign closes tonight, Tuesday's off. Um, polling will close at 10 o'clock uh, in Mongolia. Um, typically, whoever's in line by then still gets to vote. Presumably uh, by the election law, that means anyone who's checked in and has their fingerprint checked by then would be able to vote. Uh, just a little bit of a concern from my part that uh, the way the COVID restrictions have been run out, you know, physical distancing between voters, um, disinfection of hands, um, masks, all that, it's just going to slow everything down. So we'll see whether some of the really big ridings in the city, whether we'll end up with large lines in the end and how late the voting might go. In principle, of course, with electronic voting uh, counting machines, the results are relatively fast. Um, but we'll also see lots of uh, manual recounts, uh, partly those that are mandated by the law, uh, but also some where the, the results will be closed. Well, we'll see some manual recounts. So it kind of, the you know, people ask me, so when are we going to see results? Well, that really kind of depends on how clear the results are. If we see um, a very strong result in any direction, then probably we'll hear about it relatively earlier. But if the, if the results are a bit closer, or even if a lot of the races are much closer, um, which I think we're kind of expecting at least for the city races to be the total number of votes to be pretty similar for some candidates, then it might, you know, we might just have to wait for some of the manual recounts to confirm. Um, and so in practice, I think that probably means uh, maybe Thursday night, um, uh, Mongolian time, uh, if, if something doesn't happen very quickly on Wednesday night even. Uh, but I, I would think that by Friday, at least we should have uh, real results. Um, there's no legal specification of when parliament has to meet. So in the past, uh, typically the first session is in September. And so the new government has usually been uh, voted in then. But that also depends um, that whether, uh, whether the MPP continues in government after winning an election, if it does, um, then there's really no urgency unless Prime Minister Hulso, presumably him again then, would want to exchange people in and out of cabinet. Um, but if there's a change of government, probably we'd have a, a, a have parliament um, come together more quickly and make a change. Uh, in the meantime, uh, we'll keep writing. I think we're on a great run in that we've had a post every day for the last 13 days. Um, I don't know that we've ever had a period like that. We're having a good time, even though we're all not in Mongolia, which is too bad. But fortunately, we have people like Robert who are also writing posts for us uh, who are uh, on the ground. So keep checking there. Um, and uh, hopefully everything will go well on Wednesday and then we'll have some kind of a post-election event as well, I think. So thanks for coming today and I'll...